Welcome back to this episode of Silver Linings Podcast, uh, an episode that's been very anticipated by all of us, but especially by Adam and I, because we just had too little time the past 20 years or so with Ben and Alice, but but the topic is going to be engaging for everyone. And I just want to remind y'all that that Ben was on just very recently and the response was so compelling. And some of the things he said during the podcast and then after the podcast made us realize we need Alice's story. In fact, that may for many of us optimists, that may be even the more compelling part of this, and that may be where we need the most assistance. But there are so many positive comments. I just want to read one just to highlight one of our optimists, but this was very characteristic. Ben, no troll comments. I don't know how you how you pull that off. That hasn't always been the case when we've had for us or for family members that the guests are fine, but our family has always been, tr- we're all been trolled. And the great thing about Ben is when he came on the first time, someone's like, this is, Ben, your family is great. Rex and I haven't heard that in years. And so that was thanks, <laughs> thanks to Ben. Uh, somebody said our family seemed great. So thank you again, Ben. Yeah, it's been more than five years since we've heard that. Yes. <laughs> so here, Marcy King said, Ben is incredible. I will listen to this podcast over and over to absorb it all. And we hear that a lot, and I had to do that too. Um, his information is going to help me get over the place I'm at. Have him on again, and thank you. So one of one of many comments, and I say this will even be more um, more applicable, I, I believe. So let's get into it a little bit. Um, we want to meet, we want everyone to meet Alice. Uh, Adam and I found out just in chatting ahead of time, Alice isn't the best person to talk about herself. And, uh, <laughs> she undersells too much. So if I turn it over to her, she'd say, yeah, I'm a mom. I've got three boys and we do. <laughs> so that'd be it. Ben, would you introduce Alice? I promise we'll hear a lot from Alice. But uh, let's have Ben do the intro. Yeah, I think we definitely need to hear a lot from Alice. Um, There was a comment that I had read on that podcast. Please have Alice on. I know that she has valuable information, valuable experience. Um, I think what I said in the podcast before is the way that I describe her most of the time, the most compassionate, kindest, most forgiving, most patient woman on the planet. I mean, I cannot overstate that the things that we've been through and what she's done for me and for our family while she's going through her own things is something that I haven't seen in anyone um, that's at the same level. And that's just because I experienced it from my perspective and because I know how much I did to self-destruct and the struggles that I had and how powerful they were in an effect on our family. And she was able to travel through that while being a mom and keeping the boys healthy and happy and maintaining our relationship and doing her own coping and traveling through all of these things. And she really did all of that. I say often um, about our oldest son that she raised him as a single mom because I deployed um, 300 days a year on average in my first six year stint. And then when I was contracting, I was 90 days gone and 30 days at home. And that whole time she was on the reverse schedule of doing all the things with all these boys, um, doing crazy boy things and growing into young men and all of that. And that was 18 years from when we got in, when Dana was less than a year old until I got out in 2018 and he was a senior in high school. And she did all of that in my mind as a single mom Um, while I was party dad and deployment dad and all of those things. And then in addition to, you know, she held down jobs and she um, ran the household and she struggled through her own side of PTSD while I struggled through mine. And she's an amazing woman. Well, with that, with that introduction, Alice, how are you feeling with that? (laughs) Well, I mean, whereas he says I'm like, you know, his biggest supporter and all of that, you know, same goes for him. He is for me as well. So 
Um, doesn't surprise me what he says. This is what I, I hear from him often, and I love it that that's how he feels. Um, hopefully, I can share some of that um, and and help people kind of understand our our story, and and that helps people. Rex and I, Rex and I are super excited that you guys stayed married. Rex and I have not done that, so you guys are way up here, and we're down here trying to figure this thing out. Uh, Rex got remarried. I'm still waiting for my shot. But you guys stayed together through thick and thin. When I say thin, I'm sure times got to the point where you both had said, we're not going to be married anymore, which a lot of couples do in just in normal life. Um, so hopefully as we go through this journey, we can, we'll can learn a little bit more about you know what you did and all that. Uh, I remember at one point, a bit on your last on your last podcast you were on with us, you mentioned that um, the letters that you guys were writing back and forth, you went back and read some of those, or Alice went back and read some of those uh, while you were out in the field and she was here. And so, was there something about those letters that you said you went back and read them? Did that help with the relationship later, or was it during the time, or what? I think that. Um, during the time of being able to write those letters. So this, uh, the time that you're talking about was during deployment of him uh, contracting, not actually being active duty. Um, those six years were definitely the toughest six years. There wasn't a lot of communication. So any emails and even conversations that we were able to have on stat phones and things like that were very limited. Um, even emails, a sentence or two. Um, it was basically just to say, I'm alive. Um, but during contracting, we were actually able to communicate a lot more. And those letters, um, emails were are just extremely precious to me. Um, something that probably bothers Benjamin is that I my email, I have to go through and delete every day, um, spam and whatever, because I have so many emails. I am uh, really, really nervous about deleting a chunk of emails because I don't want any of them to be the ones that we sent to each other. Um, going back and reading those, uh, just a week or two ago, I went and read one that just, it summed up, um, and I should probably, maybe at some point I'll, I'll find it and read it, you know, maybe on the live one or something. I yeah, can read it. Great. It sums up our family and in this short little email so much um, but going back and reading those, it just brings me back to that time. And yes, there were tough times, but how much we expressed to each other, it was hard to be away and go through the struggles that we are going through and be away from each other and to to feel the love and the just the desire of wanting to be together during that time through these emails. It, it It's something really special and i i hold those emails really like as a treasure to me so well and to add just a little bit of context to that because of the way that we were apart from each other this was our best means of communicating everything logistics <laughs> trouble with the boys hospital stays you know struggles that we're having all of those Cell things phone issues, yeah really. um issues with the bills or with daily life you know all the things that you talk about with your spouse on a regular basis that i call logistics conversations when you're eating dinner or when you're in the car or something like that we had to do all of that through email and uh when i was active duty it's the special operations task force so any email you send is read any conversation you have on the phone is listened to. And so we had very surface level communication during those times. And she doesn't know what's happening from this communication to the next. And so I could literally not be here anymore. And we were doing high value targets and high profile missions. And so she was from one communication to the next, waiting for a communication from the state department saying that I wasn't coming home. And that is its own struggle. So then when we were able to communicate and connect on a much more personal level while I was deployed, we valued that so much because of the experience we had previously. Okay, so let's let's take that and dive a little deeper just with that thought. That communication is so labored. Now Ben's home for a certain period of time or maybe an undetermined period of time. How did those dynamics go? 
We don't talk anymore. <laughs> we we spend enough time talking. Talk less. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. So transitioning from active duty, which he's gone 300 days out of the year, like he said, um, pretty much full-time single mom. That's that's how it was during those six years. He would come home for a day after being gone a month and then home a day or two and then gone two months. Like it, it just, it was sporadic. It was random home a week, then gone two weeks, you know, and then for maybe a month, he'd be in and out the door and just random. So it just was sporadic. Whereas once we got out and he was now deploying, um, we had more of a schedule and uh, it was uh, six, sorry, three months gone and one month home. And when he was home, he was just disrupting all the schedule. So, yeah. So, you know, he would come home and sometimes we would know exactly when he came home and sometimes he would try and surprise us. And so then he would surprise me, but the kids would be at school. So then we'd go surprise the kids at school and pull them out. And during that month, sometimes they'd go to school, sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes we were going to see a midnight movie. Um, Like it was just all over the place. The the boys didn't want to go to sleep at night. They wanted to just hang out with dad and Sometimes, you know, for a week, we would go on a little trip just for the two of us and the kids were with friends and everything. It was just all over the place. And then he left and went back. And I'm like, no, you have to go to school. No, you, you have to go to bed. Clean up the mess. Of um, it's almost like when about. grandma comes over and gives everybody sugar and then leaves the kids with right. you. Kind of thing. That was, yes. Yeah. Santa came and brought presents and then he left and then he left you with the mess. Right. So we did have a transition to kind of go back to that question between deployment and party dad and our relationship and how we operated to when I came home and was home all the time. And we would joke all the time um, with other guys and their wives that were like, so how long was he at home permanently before you said, like, don't you have a deployment or do you want to go back to contracting? Because you get really involved in your schedule and you get used to having it the way that you operate. And when it works, it's it's great. And then you're home full time with each other, sharing every day with each other after you haven't done that for a very long time. And there is this period where the kids had to get used to me being dad. I had to get used to being in that role of being an authority in the house or doing some of the discipline or helping the kids with homework, the things that she had taken on 100% of the time. We had to adjust to okay, this is how we want to work together in our house. And this is how we want to communicate. And there was a time there where we struggled for communication. We struggled to find our pathway forward together in a house where we were together. And it sounds silly because you'd think, well, you want to be home all the time. And that's what we were working toward. And it is what we wanted. And then when we got there, we struggled through it to try to figure out how to live together and how to operate together as a family when we're home together all the time. And that's odd. Um, But it took work and it took us talking through everything. And I think that's kind of the theme of this is just how important honest and open communication is. I think that's something that we learned bit by bit over years. And then we valued that ability to communicate with each other honestly, even more when we were together all the time because we needed it so much to get through all of it. All right. Yeah, and I will add that that's something, you know, we were talking uh, before uh, we started this podcast just about some of the things and mention, you mentioned um, kind of what are some things that if we could go back um, and kind of give some advice of what we didn't do well or, or you know, uh, we struggled with is I would say some of that honest conversations um, during really hard struggling times um, where he was really struggling with his PTSD. I was going through my own and this, the struggles that he was dealing with um, was bringing up a lot of my negative I am statements as, as he would say. Um, And during that time, I don't think we were having as many honest conversations as we probably needed to have. Um, We were, but we weren't, 
being as communicative in times where we were just individually struggling and we needed to kind of voice that so that each other knew where we were. Um, and that's definitely something I would give as advice to somebody is don't be afraid to have those very honest conversations about where you are, where what you're feeling, um, the struggles you're personally going through, even if you know this other person is struggling as well. Um it's it's really important. Was was part of it knowing that you know that you know Ben being in special ops and seeing a bunch of crazy stuff and having PTSD. Did he know that you had PTSD? Worrying like, is he coming home? Um, knowing that you're stressing out with all the kids and not not having normal things that you see other couples having. Did he understand why he was going through all of his stuff? That you also were that, or were you trying to be strong? And be like, okay, I got this. Things are fine. And and so he was just like, okay, I'm doing my thing. You take care of this. So I think there's a couple of things to, to pull out of that. First of all, um, I think uh, he, kind, he kind of knew, but I don't think he knew the extent until out afterwards. Until you snapped um, and it's like, look, um, I can't do this anymore. Um, I think that's accurate. Yeah. Like, I don't think he was completely you know, naive to the whole thing and, and didn't realize that it, it was really hard for me. I mean, the, the wives all knew you don't just go over unannounced. If you do just walk in, um, you don't knock on the door. Uh, that's, uh, not something that you want to hear is your, uh, we didn't have like, um, any other, that's how they were going to come and tell us if, if our husband was not coming home. Oh, gotcha. And so uh, the last thing that you want is a knock at the door, your doorbell ringing. So uh, we, you know, we were just always in communication with each other as far as the wives and everything. And we knew when each other were going to come over. And if not, you just kind of gave a little tap and walk in. Um, And that was just known. It wasn't necessarily something that was discussed. You didn't want to discuss that kind of stuff. Um, But I expressed some of that to somebody after we got out. And I think that kind of comment made him go, wow, I mean, I just, uh, that wasn't something he had to experience, you know? Um, so all of that, uh, you know, being a single mom, not wanting to leave the house because that might be when he got to call and I could speak to him for 30 seconds, you know, I, I'm going to miss my 30 seconds of right. knowing the wor- the worst thing is coming home and he got to, he had to leave a voicemail on on the phone uh, it just it tears you it up breaks your heart because you were you there cry yourself to sleep that yeah. night you know that may have been my opportunity to hear his voice and talk to him we might have to explain we didn't live in the 50s <laughs> we just were stationed in okinawa and we had landlines in the base housing yeah all right and so she's talking about you're in base housing that's your phone we didn't have <laughs> cell phones uh, sure. there was a different network over there and we didn't have phones for it and we had landlines And so you were literally subject to that phone call. And if you were out of the house, you weren't getting it. So that's what she's talking about. Um, But then then in addition to that kind of PTSD of just um, not not knowing, is is he coming home? And when can I talk to him? And, you know, just being this living in this life of I'm kind of on my own, I Every decision I make, every, everything, I can't discuss it with him. I have no way of talking to him. Um, so all of that being said, I also struggled with my own trauma throughout my life. And um, we can touch on that now if you want. Um, yeah, that's, that's where I was kind of going because I know a lot of times um, women that are probably watching this podcast right now put on a smiley face for everybody else. They make everything look like everything's fine because they want everybody, their kids not to worry, their husbands not to worry, their friends. They put on this big happy face, but deep down inside, they are struggling. Um, how do you, what advice do you give to women who are in that situation right now that are listening? Um. It's okay. It's okay to talk about it. It's part of who you are. And it's people are going to understand you and 
love you no matter what. And if they don't, it's okay. It, it, it's all right to be you and admit or talk about or whatever all the struggles that you went through. Um, and I, I have a lot of trauma in my life. I, um, went through several divorces, not, not my own, I, through, through being a kid. My parents got divorced when I was really young, both of them remarried. And then, uh, my dad eventually got divorced after finding out that my stepmom was emotionally and verbally abusing me, which then I was blamed for the divorce. And, Wow. Um, was separated from the siblings of from that side because I was made out as the bad person in all of this. Mm. Um, I how, how old were you when that happened, Alice? How old were you? I was in high school when that divorce happened. Damn, such rough. Um, when I was being emotionally and verbally abused by my stepmom and um, blamed for it and that divorce and everything. Um, so that that was tough. Um, I, uh, went through sexual abuse in high school, um, a tragic event that happened. Um, I was in the dance and cheerleading world for many, many, many years, which was great and wonderful, but it also, um, during that time, it's a, it brings up a lot of, um, body shame issues that I was having to deal with weigh-ins every week um and it's affected me long term with my weight how i look um things like that um i was in a verbally and emotionally abusive relationship um also high school and college time period um so i i do have a a, a lot of negative i am statements there that then when you are with somebody who um, is is struggling with PTSD and self-destructive and they're trying to actually disconnect from you because of what they're dealing with, um, that can actually cause all of my negative I am statements to then come out, be worse, and you start putting it on you and thinking... Um, this is because I'm not good enough because I, I don't, he, he doesn't love me because I don't look a certain way is, you know, one of, one of my things, um, or, or this or that, or what, whatever it is. Um, and that was really hard for me and something that I had to really try to remind myself, it's not about me. This isn't about me at all. Um, it, it's not something I could remember all the time, and, and it's it's not going to be something you can recall all the time, but it would be something that I would say, you know, write in lipstick on your mirror in your bathroom. It's not about you um, to somebody that might be going through this right now. Um, as often as you can remember that, the better. And this is linking that back to that honest conversation um, that's where I wish I would have been a little bit more honest to let him know. It's not that he didn't know some of the things that he was doing was hurting me, but how was it hurting me? How, how most specifically was it hurting me? Um, well, and she's such a strong individual and she has such a powerful work ethic and she was going to do everything that she needed to do to keep the boy safe and moving and growing and all of the things were going to be handled no matter how she felt. And I didn't always know exactly how she was feeling because a lot of times we were doing our thing. You know, I'm deploying, I'm doing my work or I'm getting done what I need to get done and she's getting done what she needs to get done. And I think we didn't have enough of that conversation that said, I'm really struggling. I really need your help or I need support from someone. And we just both kind of went along assuming, okay, you're having a tough time, but we're getting it done. And I totally agree with what she said that I think for anybody listening to this or struggling through these things, communicate more the honest truth about how you're feeling and about what you need. It's okay to do that. We often think I'm going to protect the other person by handling my own stuff. 
and not putting a burden on them. And the opposite is true. You need the support. You need the connection. You both need to know how you're doing. Um, we have several stories that can illustrate being surprised by how each other were feeling. You know, I was expressing to Alice one time in the car how I was crumbling and how I had had um, suicidal ideations. When she started crying and we pulled over, she could hardly get it out. But she's like, I haven't told you that I've been thinking about that every day. For herself, from her own struggles, and I had no idea. Because you were wrapped up in your own. Yeah, I was in my own struggle. And we see each other and we know that there's something going on. But we don't know the depth of that. And it's incredibly important to know the depth of it. And that's what Adam was referring to when he said you're being strong for other people. And you're talking about open, honest communication. But earlier you said honest and open communication. You're being, I'm sure you were being honest in your communications at that time, just not open. You didn't yeah. divulge everything because you were protecting the other person, and that's what needed, actually needed to come out. So you yeah. all of that going on, then Ben, your genetics are such that Connors are not known to communicate anyway. So the yeah. fact that you're doing any communication is, uh, is something, okay? But how do you get into, how do you create the safe space with, when you have a relationship with someone else, whether it's your spouse, children, adult children, whomever it is, how do you create the safe space to be able to divulge those struggles that you are keeping in to protect them? Man, that's a hard one. Can I do some clinical and then... Yeah. You answer it. Is that okay? Sure. And, um, He's got charge. With, we can split it with you. <laughs> with ice cream. <laughs> uh, found okay. ice cream. I'm going to buy you some blue barrel. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually, finances were tough for us. Um, when we were first married, there are a lot of stories of our financial struggles. But even when we got into the military, I was enlisted. Um, and we qualified for WIC. We were getting diapers and formula and milk and cheese. Um, with stamps at the store while I was serving in the military and paying taxes and all of that stuff. We, we were below the poverty level um, with kids in our household while I was deploying um, for some of that. And so we struggled with finances greatly. And we'd never been taught um, how to manage money. That was always a very private thing in my house and in her house as kids. And so when we talked about finances, both of us were triggered. We were immediately defensive Things were very tough to talk about, and <laughs> we started having those conversations over a bowl of ice cream because I couldn't get mad while I was eating ice cream. And this is a, you know, it's kind of a silly thing, but set the table to prepare yourselves for the conversation. If you're going to eat soup, you can't put out a fork and eat soup, right? So if you're going to have a tough conversation, put yourselves in a place where you can be connected. Right now, we're, you know, holding hands or... You know, we have skin on skin contact because we're talking about difficult things. And this helps us know that I'm supporting you. I'm here with you in this. We're traveling through this together. This isn't an individual thing that's happening here. And we don't have to defend ourselves. We're right here together, exposed, touching each other. Like this is an important thing in our communication. And so one of those clinical ideas is set the table, do it on purpose and put something in place that helps you to be connected during that conversation. Sit next to each other, look at each other, touch each other, be connected for the tough conversations. And if you need, you know, Girl Scout cookies while you're having that conversation, then eat those, you know? And um, that's part of what we've done and what we've continued to do for a long time that's helped. And I pass that on to my clients all the time. I think it's incredibly important. And I will just add that I think just understanding, and it's okay if you don't completely understand how your your partner in this situation, this where, wherever whoever you're having these tough conversations with, maybe you don't fully understand exactly how they're going to react in these situations, and and that's okay. But understanding that everybody does have different responses and responses and reactions to these types of conversations, so 
your spouse or your the, the person that you're having the conversation with might cry. They might get upset. They might be angry. And it's up to them to 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 respond in, in whatever way is, you know, accurate for them. Um, but it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's directed to you or, you know, on, on to you. It's uh, something it's just their reaction to it. Um, that is something that I have really had have had to learn about him. It, we don't react the same way to a lot of things, um, but I would say finances would be one of them, since that's kind of the topic right here um, that he brought up. We don't react the same way. And um, throughout our struggles, we, we don't react the same way to those. The way we disagree, we don't respond or react the same way. I'm very sensitive. He's very direct. Um, I will tell you that doesn't really go very well together. <laughs> um, I get hurt a lot. Um, it's taken me a really long time and I wouldn't even say that I'm 100% like, okay, I can just let that go or whatever. Um, but I do understand more that that's not directed towards me that tone, that, yeah, he's not coming from a place of attack. He's That's his response. And it's okay to have that response. Now, to direct it to, to me when, you know, that's not what this is about. It's supposed to just be a conversation that, you know, would be different. But, you know, that a lot of times this is just his reaction. And so I think just kind of understanding that you are different people, you're coming together to try to have a conversation to, um, understand where each other are and it's okay if you're not both on the same page reaction wise or with what exactly needs to happen moving moving forward it's it's okay to be on different pages at some point in order to make a decision you're going to have to come together but in the conversation it's okay to be in different places and to have a different outlook or response or anything like that and it, it's okay to lead to the conversation having felt strong emotions and then not being all tied up in a bow, you know, like a like a 30 minute sitcom or something like that. You can leave it where it is, having traveled through that together, communicated honestly and not come to a conclusion. It's all right to do that. Um, I think we always got this advice when we we're getting married, you know, don't go to bed angry or don't leave anything unresolved. And I like to get into things and have them resolved. And Alice doesn't know her response all the time. And so she might need a couple of days to figure things out, to sort through her own thoughts and feelings and come back to me and communicate again. And I think that's something we struggled with for a long time was that I wanted it finished. I wanted a solution. You know, I'm thirsty. I want the glass of water. I want to not be thirsty anymore. And it's over. And she didn't respond well to that. And it would cause disruption in our communication, you know, shutting down because she knew it needed to be resolved in order for me to feel good about it. And we had to travel through the idea of allowing things to still be undetermined and unresolved, but having expressed them and having been honest and allowing each other the space to think about it and to come up with how we feel and what we need to do to move forward. And it's okay to do that. When I loved though, you guys, what I loved about what you guys said was Al said that she's sensitive and, you, and you're more direct. You have two different types that don't always go hand in hand. And if you're one type of personality, it's really hard to understand the other person's personality that's sensitive and it's not sensitive. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot of couples that are probably in that same situation where one is, but to understand it, well, once you guys decided that, look, I know you're sensitive and maybe when Ben says, look, I know you're sensitive um, and this, hopefully this doesn't come out to be where you feel like I'm attacking you. You guys have worked that out to now where you both understand each other, where before, if you don't ever talk about it, you just, you go to your room crying and he's upset that you're crying, but he's like, look, I, this is how I am. This is, this is what I want without, you know, communicating. And I think there's a lot of people that if they figure out, it's almost like figuring out what your love language is, what's your, what's your fight language or what's your, your yeah, you got, yeah, yeah. communication. And how do you act when you're spun up, when you're triggered? Yeah. That I think Adam is the key because when you have someone going through PTSD and depression and you have somebody who's trying to handle you going through that, you're not going to do it the same way. My isolation response 
is not going to help her need for connection to be supportive to me. She wants to support me. She wants to help me. She doesn't know how, and I'm busy trying to isolate so I can protect her from my reaction. And to understand that that's not a personal attack, and it doesn't mean that I don't want you to help me, it's very difficult to come around to. But those different ways of communicating, different ways of struggling, if we'd been able to communicate that early on, we would have saved ourselves a lot of trouble. If we would have been able to say, every once in a while when we're having an argument, I need space and it's okay, we're going to come back to it later. It's not about you, it's me sorting through my feelings and that's all right, we'll do that. If we're able to say those types of things and have that kind of strategy for our communication, early on we would have been a lot better off. We struggled through all that, learning those things step by step and argument by argument or struggle by struggle. Um, But the thing that saved that and helped us come around to it was continuing to be open, continuing to be honest and saying the things that were hard to say. And I'll just add one more thing that that with all this being said and the things that we know about each other now, it doesn't mean that we're perfect in it even now knowing what we know (laughs) um there's still times when we get into disagreement where he's direct and i'm sensitive and we come away from it being hurt but it's it's understanding and knowing that that's more of what it is that we're just communicating differently and and reacting to it differently and feeling it differently and so we're we're able to come together quicker faster whatever you want to say um at the end of it, a little bit easier now because of it. It doesn't necessarily change. Like, I can't change who I am. He can't change who he is. And and that's not what we're saying people should do. But it's it's recognizing it. And it's understanding that that is my spouse. And that's how they are. And maybe I need to not be so direct. Maybe I need to not be so sensitive. But you can't help who you are. You can I said, so, yeah, you are who you are. Uh, Rex, you you mentioned on a podcast, one of our podcasts we did, maybe early days of our podcast, Rex did a whole thing on trust. Um, and people just loved it, the way Rex explained the, the trust situation in, in a relationship. And you two, is, was there a trust situation since he was gone all the time and you were here? Did you guys talk about trust? Did you have... So there's some couples that just automatically trust or work for trust. Or was trust one of those things that that caused more stuff between you or no? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And Rex, Rex explains trust better than anybody. I mean, the way he did this podcast, everybody was like, oh, my gosh, that makes so much sense. Rex, can you elaborate? Some, do you remember what you even said? <laughs> Of course, I remember it. <laughs> yes, that's a big, big part of the book that I released before we did our book together. But now I'll, I'll save that for Ben analysis therapy session when okay, we're perfect. trading back and forth. You know, it's, as we go, because I want to ask this to Alice. I think I think a lot of people are going to going to want to know this too, because Ben shared with us while he's finding his struggles. Of course, he went to the VA. That didn't work out so well. <laughs> he destroyed a brand new uh, therapist, apparently. <laughs> yeah. VA. And so he's left on his own to try to find how to heal, et cetera. Well, here you are, different person, different personality. You can't find healing on his coattails. How did you approach making sense of it, finding healing, Alice? We inquiring minds want to know. Well, this is a good question. And one that, to be honest, um, I was hoping maybe wouldn't come up. <laughs> yeah, well, I, would I will just tell you, I, and and <laughs> here's here's why. Um, I you know right now in in this space that we've been in recently, I love mental health therapists, all of that. I you know before. I, I I struggled and I tr- I tried to find therapist after therapist after therapist that I could connect with. And it's a hard thing. It's not the same as you get a recommendation to somebody that when you have a broken arm or you uh, need to go to the doctor to get antibiotics, you can go to somebody that maybe just you don't connect with, but they're going to write you a prescription. They're going to fix your arm. They're going to do surgery on you and they're good. They're good at what they do. That's a little different. When you're going to a therapist, you you want to go to somebody good that can can help you. 
but you also have to connect with them. And I was having a hard time with that. I tried. Um, so I was a little bit like Ben and that I just kind of had, I was left to my own devices. Um, I, I will tell you uh, just some of the things that I kind of thought of and how I coped with a lot of what I was dealing with, whether it was personal based on my own trauma or based on the fact that here I am living with somebody and s- supporting somebody who's going through their struggles and their struggles then is increasing my struggles. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I thought of is that I I had to take a break from some of that heaviness. And I would suggest to anybody that you do, you have to give your mind a break from that kind of stuff. Um, It doesn't mean that I like left the family and went off on a, you know, retreat or something like that, which I'm not saying downplaying and that, that might be great for people. But I focused on what I say the dailies. He likes to call them the basic I call call them the dailies because I think it's a little bit more involved than just I need food and I need sleep and that kind of basic things. But I focused on my daily work, um, which was mostly taking care of my boys, which I loved. I loved being a mom of these three young boys. And so I, I, I didn't learn to cook when I was younger. Um, so I read cookbooks, like literally read them from cover to cover, like you would read a novel. Um, and it does it. I suggest that for anybody that doesn't cook because you really learn recipes and things like that. Anyways, that's for another podcast. (laughs) Um, but uh, you know, I, I read cookbooks. I learned how to cook and I was very passionate about it. I wanted to be inventive and creative and for the family. And I took a lot of joy in that. Um, just doing things with the boys. Um, I did elaborate birthday parties for them. That doesn't mean that I spent a lot of money on them. I just learned how to be creative with how I baked a cake and decorated the cake. And I made a lion cake one time. And I, I'm not a baker and I'm not, um, yeah, I don't. Good at decorating. Yeah, decorating food or whatever. I don't do that. Um, I, you know, I made homemade decorations. I made a full pinata one time. I, you know, just things like that, that I just put a lot of time into. Um, And that helped. I would include self-care in this kind of arena. Um, That was my self-care. I would say my self-care now is different than then. Now my self-care is I like to work out. I like to read books. I I love to go for walks or a hike or, you know, things like that. That wasn't my life then. Then it was really wrapped around my boys. And that was what I took a lot of joy in. And so I would, that was just kind of my healing is taking a break from this, these constant conversations or deep emotions that I could focus on something else and kind of give my mind a break. So that was one of the, the ways that, that I coped, I guess. Um, in regards to therapy, I am still in search <laughs> of um, who I would say would, and and I am, honestly, I have uh, seen somebody recently that I've discovered I don't connect with. <laughs> um, so I, but I, I do really think it's very important. So if you can find somebody that you can connect with it, it is so important, just like going to the doctor for, you know, your regular things. Um, during this t- this type of stuff, trauma or supporting somebody with trauma, it's so important that you find a therapist. I completely so. and that that connection is what Adam. That's why Adam brought up the trust issue. Trust is a foundation of that connection, is it not? And Ben has some brilliant insight to that. Dealing with veterans and PTSD, you have some wonderful insight, and you're at the part of the journey that. Everyone is now waiting, going to wait for the other shoe to drop, Alice. Okay, so what'd you do next? Let you fly. And what what's your journey? Uh, <laughs> you know you aren't gonna be able to end this story right here with that. Uh, with well, that's that. the thing, is the journey keeps going. Like uh that we we actually have a, a one of our mottos, we have a couple. One of our m- mottos is finding joy in the journey. And during this time that we really struggled so much, um, 
and and we did. We struggled a lot, but we also had amazing moments, you know, whether they were just at home, simple little things or as a family or just, you know, we yeah, the emails that we the, made memories. Yeah. Uh, moments. We found our joy in small things. She talked about shifting her focus and, you know, decorating a cake. There, there are times when you can be free of these things that are struggle and feel joy and feel happiness and peace and all of those things. You just have to search for that, value that, get into it as much as you can. That's part of it for sure. But the reason why I brought that up is because it is, it's a journey. We're still on this journey. We're, our journey has not finished just because we've pulled out of a time when he was so much in this struggle of self-destruction and and just really struggling with all the things that he was. And my trauma, it, it's something that you're going to continue to you know, feel or be brought up. And so it is a journey. Um, so I understand people might still want to know where this goes and my journey. Well, we're excited for Ben's book and you and Ben are going to write a book together. We're making that announcement now. <laughs> we're we're excited. announcing other people's books. Other people's books. Because, uh, so, uh, but man, I learned a ton. Um, and I'm sure there's a more there's going to be tons more questions and and things that people uh, will have after hearing this and processing this. And again, we're going to have you guys come on a live as well to be able to you know answer people live, which I absolutely love. And I'm sure the the optimists who listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube uh, will appreciate being since now you guys have figured out at least how to do all the things that you've done to to make it this far um which i think is which is very credible and it's a lot of hard work i know people think oh it's just we're just doing it there's no there's a lot of struggling and hard work and a lot of effort and effort is something that sometimes we give up on because like i just can't do it anymore just i I, i'm past my limit so you guys to be able to continue with your efforts have been awesome um Rex, any other things before we we wrap up that you, that you think we need to ask them? Well, I'm going to I'm going to put a tease out there. I didn't ask permission from the three of you, but um, we've been talking not on the podcast, off the air. Let me put a tease out of of a couple of our plans because Adam and I feel like we have direction now, actually with this with this community, and you're listening to it. You're listening to that direction. We want to help people find resources. And we know that we aren't the resource, first of all, on our podcast. We are a resource, but there are so many that need to be done. There are so many underserved populations, just what Alice is talking about. And right now we're thinking of three levels of of resources where someone without spending a dime can come to our library and I'm saying this partly because we need a volunteer to help us. <laughs> we need to catalog our our podcasts, not every minute, not every subject, just the ones that deal with trauma and finding resources. So anyone can come to the community and easily find a podcast like this podcast. Good grief, what couples or what people in re- any relationships wouldn't want to listen to this this story, and uh, we think it's only part way finished, um, but people need to find it easily. As time goes on, it's harder to find, so we, so we need to do that. And that's one level of help that anyone can do anytime, whether you have no money, no other resources. Um, we'll talk about other resources as we go. But then there is the third resource. I know math. I know I skipped number two. But the third resource is where we... we can connect people with professionals that might be able to help them. Ben's a professional in this, but he's limited in what he can do outside of the state of Texas versus what he can do inside the state of Texas. We want all that information and as many resources as we get catalog so people can find the resources they need. Um, ben has some brilliant, unique ideas about how to find a counselor, like like uh, Alice is, is talking about. But We'll talk about that the appropriate time. I'm teasing right now. Not meaning I'm not telling the truth, meaning that's something to come. Okay. But the second level in between one and three is we want 
to help people find peer-to-peer type resources. Someone that's been through it and is willing to volunteer their time or at a nominal cost so you can find someone that you can talk to. Talk Because processing is such an important early step in the whole thing. Having open OS communication, not everyone has someone to process with. And so if we if you can find someone that you can connect with and we can be a connection for that, we want to do that. So a lot, a lot coming, a lot being developed behind the scenes, so to speak. I'm also saying this because we'll have a live this weekend with Ben and Alice on it. We want to hear um, your questions and your ideas of what you have needed, resources you found, and we that'll be the start of an ongoing dialogue. So we want to be doing that. Um, we want to to do this as well and at the pace we can realistically do it. You know, we all have lives and, um, you know, we'd love to do it all at once, but it's going to be a step-by-step journey. You're just here for the beginning of it. Thanks for being here for that. So stay tuned with us. We think Ben and Alice are going to be um, significant contributors to everything, whether it's ideas or coming on, more talking, more appearances. Um, Adam and I will try to stay alive. I'm the old one, so that's particularly important for me. Mm. The only other thing I'll say, closing, and and I'll give you all your own chance. Um, You've heard from Alice. I know you're a maze buyer, as as we all are, including Ben. And uh, so I'll be the bad guy. I'll be the one to tell you that she does have flaws, that I'm aware of. The only one I'm aware of is she has three sons, and they are just marvelous little people. Now they've grown since I've seen them. But I know as as, uh, younger people... Ages, I don't know, last time I saw them, maybe 8 to 12, somewhere in, in that range. But they're Spurs fans. She raised three San Antonio Spurs fans. I don't blame Alice for that because she comes by it um, kind of naturally. She had to do it because Alice told you about her involvement in the, what did you call it, Alice? Cheerleading? and Dance and cheerleading world. <laughs> Yeah, and how does that translate to raising Spurs fans? Well, I I was a Spurs silver dancer, so uh... hey, she has a championship. She was there in '99. That was because obviously she was part of the Duncan and Robinson connection that made that happen. Now you know who I am. Without Alice, it would have been just Duncan and Robinson trying to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, impossible. So I had to ra- raise Spurs fans. Hopefully. I know. I didn't think of that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> One correction: Our middle son wants to be different than everyone in the family, and he did sit next to the couch, next to his brother on the couch, um, while he was wearing a Kawhi Leonard jersey, and our middle son was wearing a LeBron James jersey. So oh. he is definitely not a Spurs fan. <laughs> he goes against all of our sports uh, needs and wants because he wants to be different. So she only raised two. Okay. Looking so that we give give credit where credit's due. Well, in redeeming value there. Very good. Very good. Yeah. But please stay tuned. Come to the live. Uh, there's a lot here. If you don't need this help personally, I bet you know a whole lot of people that do. So stick with us on it. Adam, what are your closing comments? We'll get Ben and then Alice the last word. Oh, I, I just, I appreciate them coming on. I like to learn on our podcast. If you know anybody that needs help with healing or processing or, uh, you know, with the, we have trials that are going on right now with Chad. A lot of people are reaching out to me. I appreciate Ben sent me a private message and, you know, people do that, you know, to Rex and I, because of all the stuff that's going on. So we just appreciate everybody, uh, especially during this time and, uh, and thank them, uh, Ben and Alice for coming on. It's, you know, it's hard sometimes to share your own personal life on, radio or podcast or tv or whatever it is uh and you guys did a great job and uh, can't wait to learn more from you uh on the live when you guys come back here ben uh yeah thanks thanks for bringing us back um i know it's easier to bring me back when i have alice here uh that's usually how i get invited to things anyway so i'm used i get it i get it um 
And I would just say that there really is more to her um, than she's able to explain in this small moment. And I think that there's a lot that she can provide to people who are struggling with people who are struggling with PTSD. Um, she certainly traveled through it. She certainly has her doctorate in support and um, love and being able to help others cope and to be able to connect with someone who's struggling in that way. And she just has more. So come back and get more from her. Ask her questions. Um, don't hold back on the questions that you ask. We are very open with our you know, idea to help and our desire to help. And so just put it on put it on comment or put it wherever it needs to go so that she can help you with whatever it is that you have a question about. She knows so much about this. That's generous of you to donate her time. Alice, would you like to defend yourself? Sure. Well, I was going to say that um, I, I do agree with what he says. Um, I I do feel like I have a lot more to share. I, w- I will share that I am kind of a quiet, um, shy person it, it does take me a lot. I, I'm glad you guys, you know, can't see my armpits. I'm sweating like crazy. Um, like I am very nervous to do this, but I will say that if anything that I have been through, if just one little thing that I can share helps anybody. Uh, that's that's what I want. And that's why I'm here. Um, I don't I I probably would have said said no a million times, but um, but I do gen genuinely want to share the things that we've been through because we have been through so much that I I know it's got to help at least one person. So if it can help at least one person, then then I, I want to do that. And so for that reason, I'm an open book. So please ask anything. Um, I, I want to share whatever. I do have lots of stories that we've been discussing over the last few days before, you know, doing this um, that I can share. So, uh, so much more to to talk about um, and and I'm ready for it. And thank you so much for, for having me. And I look forward to next time. All right. And that is the Silver Lining Podcast. We'll see you on the live. We'll see you on the live. We'll see you on the live.